Y'all are all quiet out there. I, I told them that, I told the choir that's because Linda was up here. Right? It is, man, y'all are just, wake up. <laughs> I, y'all feel like I, I do this morning. But anyways, it is good to see you this morning. Uh, a couple things to mention to you real quick. Uh, tonight, we're going to Little Wissy. ask that you meet us there at Coastal Manor. At, and we're going to start at 530. Uh, if you didn't go last time and you want to come tonight, uh, take 84, go through. Just as you're going out of Little Wissy, Coastal Manor will be on your right. You turn in, you go around to the back of the building. That's where the road takes you. It takes you around the back of the building. When you get around back, you'll see there's two entrances. As you're facing the building from the parking lot in the back, there's one on the right. You don't want that one. You want to go on the one on the left. You'll go through that door, go down to the hallway, make a right, and then it'll be uh, like the first room on the right if we're in the same room that, we're in, uh, that we were in last time. But we're going to have a uh, mini worship service there with Linda Ann Knight. She's had a tough week. Uh, they are having an ordeal with insurance. She said they were having to pay out of pocket until they get figured out whether or not insurance is going to pay for her to get any more therapy. Uh, and it's got her kind of depressed because she knows she needs the therapy. And so I don't know what, what, what's going to take place there, but we're going to go and, and be there tonight. So just invite you to, to join us and to, to be there with us uh, as we go and just kind of minister to her and uh, Brother Lamar. Uh, we'll be there at 5.30. We'll be gone by 6.30. Uh, and I know that the weather calls for it to be raining, so get an umbrella. But uh, just... We're gonna, we, we go to seek to be a blessing uh, to her. Uh, and so that'll be in lieu of our services here tonight. Also, if you want to donate, we're asking for donations for the Georgia Baptist Children's Home. On the back, it has uh, the items that uh, they are requesting. We need those here by May 24th. They need to be at the association office by May 25th. Uh, so just make you aware of that. Uh, VBS is coming up, Vacation Bible School. Uh, we'll have a kickoff on Friday night, June 23rd at 5.30. Jeremy, what are we doing that night for supper? <laughs> Pizza. And then Saturday at lunch, do you remember that? Spaghetti, I think. All right, so uh, it will end right after we have lunch on that Saturday. Uh, so it's one day on that Saturday. The kickoff's on Friday night. Then that Sunday night, the 25th, we will have a family night. We'll have to do a fellowship afterwards. Uh, so make plans to be a part of that. We still need some workers, uh, some people that can kind of help out. You don't necessarily have to be a teacher. We just need some helpers. Uh, let me say this. There will be children's church this morning after the choir comes down or when the choir is, while they're coming down, Ava is going to escort the children over there. Teresa Boyette is starting back with the children's church, and she is over there. And so just make you aware that we'll have that this morning as well. Uh, All right, about Vacation Bible School. All right. Can you do that for us? Okay. All right. Uh, then as far as prayer list, I mentioned Linda Ann. Remember Miss Lucille? I talked to her yesterday. She's still uh, weak and uh, just continuing in her recovery. Uh, and it's with her lungs and just the ability to breathe well. So just uh, continue to remember her. Remember the Dallin Thornton family, the young boy? He passed away on Friday morning. His funeral will be tomorrow at Walkerville Baptist Church. He was eight years old, uh, was born with, uh, I think it's far, it's called Farber's disease. I'm not really sure what all that is. I've heard that before, but remember that family, also the family. Uh, Gabby and Kyle Gunter, that's Curtis and Linda's granddaughter and son-in-law, uh, grandson-in-law. Uh, they lost their baby this past week, so just continue to remember them. Uh, continue to remember Keith Brown as he continues to recover from the stroke. He's getting some better, but he's not. He still gets worn out very, very easily. So just uh, remember those. Uh, and then that one Timmy, what was his last name? Timmy Smith. That's a who is he? He's uh, Steve's uh, first cousin. Just remember him uh, in your prayers as well. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started with our worship service this morning. 
Father, we commit this time to you today. And Lord, we come before you. Lord, with these needs that uh, have been mentioned, Lord, we pray for these families. We pray for the Thornton family as they will lay their son uh, to rest tomorrow. Lord, I pray for uh, Brother Greg as he will do the funeral service tomorrow. Lord, funerals are always tough, but Lord, when it's a child, it's even, it's even tougher. I pray for uh, Gabby and Kyle. And Lord, I just pray uh, comfort for them and their loss. Lord, uh, I thank you that, that your word tells us and reminds us that you uh, comfort us in the midst of our grief, that you are one that we can rely upon, that we can lean on, that uh, one that we can come to. And Lord, that uh, you told us to bring our burdens before you. And so, Lord, we lift up these. We pray for Miss Lucille and pray for Keith and for Miss Linda Ann. Lord, others that are on the prayer list, these that we have been praying for, that some have sickness and illness, uh, disease, some have other issues that are going on. Lord, we just lift them up before you, and we thank you for the health that we enjoy to be able to be here today. I pray that as we worship you during this time today, that, Lord, as we sing, that, Lord, we remember that we sing unto you. Lord, that when we pray, we pray to you. That when we give, we give to you. Lord, when we open up your word, we read about you and what you have revealed to us through your word. So, Father, help us to give our, uh, our focus and our attention to you today, for you are worthy of our worship. And I thank you for this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you're able, let's stand and uh, sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. services, Lord. I just pray for the singing, Lord, and I pray for the preaching, God. Just everything that we do, Lord, we just pray, God, that we do it for you, to honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 
All right, take your Bibles and go with me to the to the Gospel of John. John's Gospel, John chapter 1. We're going to be at verses 29 through the end of the chapter, uh, which would be verse 51. They left him, and now he said... All right, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 29 down through the end of the chapter. So if you have a copy of God's Word and you're able to stand, I ask that you stand with me as I read uh, from God's Word. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he, re- and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water, water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You should be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man." You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you that you reveal yourself to us in your word. I pray, Father, that we may see the Lord Jesus Christ afresh, anew. Lord, that we may see that, Lord, the call is still the same, that we are to come and see and to go and tell. Father, help us to be found faithful in that regard. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we looked last week and remember the religious leaders had sent men to John the Baptist. There's two Johns that were, we're look at John. the Apostle John is the author of the Gospel of John. And he's writing here about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, the religious leaders had sent men to him saying, who are you? Are, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are, you know, who, who are you? And he, he just said, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. He said, I'm the voice. And he, and he quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. He said, I'm the voice of one cried in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. That he, he said, I'm the one that's coming before. And Jesus said later about John the Baptist that he was the Elijah who is to come. They were looking for one who would show up and say that the Messiah has arrived. And you remember, there's been 400 years of silence from the end of the book of Malachi till John the Baptist shows up on the scene. They've not heard a fresh word from God. It's been silent. They've had the scriptures. So it's not like they did not have anything. They had the scriptures, but the common people did not have the scriptures like you and I do. Most of us have more than one Bible at home. 
Most of us have multiple Bibles at home. And I was talking to somebody this week. People talk about translations and what's the best translation. Some people like the King James. Some, I preach from the New King James. Some people like the New American Standard. Some people like the Christian Standard Bible, the ESV. I'll tell you what the, the, the very best translation is. You know what the very best translation is? It's the one you read. Now, there are some translations out there that are not worth their weight. They're not... Uh, the best that I would advise against. And I'm not going to go, that's not the point of this. But the Word of God, they had the Word of God. They would go to the synagogues and they would make their yearly pilgrimage to the temple and they would hear messages. But they didn't have the Word like you and I do. And when John the Baptist showed up and began preaching this message of repentance and this baptism uh, in the Jordan River, baptizing those who came and repented of their sins, making way, pre preparing the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, that was what he testified. And so here it says, the very next day after these religious leaders had sent these men to ask John the Baptist, he says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now the Jewish people would have been familiar with the imagery of, of lambs. I want to read something to you from Warren Wiersbe about this. He said, the people of Israel were familiar with lambs for the sacrifices. At Passover, each family had to have a lamb. And during the year, two lambs a day were, were sacrificed at the temple altar, plus all the other lambs brought for personal sacrifices. Those lambs were brought by men to men, but here is God's lamb given by God to men. Those lambs could not take away sin, but the Lamb of God can take away sin. Those lambs were for Israel alone, but this Lamb would shed His blood for the whole world. And so when John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he points to Jesus. He's never, John the Baptist does, does not come seeking the attention for himself. Later we'll see here in John's Gospel that John the Baptist says in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must. Talking about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. And he tells, John the Baptist tells his disciples, he says to them, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this Lamb of God is his imagery, as Warren Wiersbe sh uh, shared, about the Passover Lamb. But it goes even before that. You go back into Genesis chapter 22, and you find there in verses 6 through 8, in, in the 22nd chapter of Genesis is where God has commanded Abraham to take now your son, your only son... Isaac. Now he had another son whose name was Ishmael, who was his firstborn son. But Ishmael was the son of Hagar and Abraham, not the son of Sarah and Abraham. Isaac was the son of promise. And God only recognized Isaac, even though Abraham appealed to God on Ishmael's behalf. But when God told Abraham to take your son, Isaac, and take him up on the mount and to there sacrifice him to me, it was a test of Abraham's faith and whether or not Abraham believed God. And we know that Abraham was found faithful, that he took Isaac up. But as they're making their way up Mount Moriah, you find in Genesis 22 that Isaac says to his father, he says, Father, he said, we've got the wood for the fire and, we, and we've got the fire. But what about the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham responded to Isaac and said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. And you know, when they got up there, Abraham took Isaac and bound him, and he was not a little boy. We, we've grown up thinking he was a little boy. He was most likely a young man, uh, somewhere between 16 and, and 20 years old, most likely. Uh, and Abraham bound him, built this altar, bound Isaac up, and laid him on the altar, pulled pulled that knife back and was prepared to sacrifice his son. And the writer in Hebrews tells us because he knew that if he sacrificed his son that God was able to bring him back to life because he knew this was the son of promise that God had made to him. It's interesting to note that up there, and you know, when, just before Abraham brought that knife down, there in the thicket, God stopped him. And there in the thicket was a ram caught by its horns. God indeed provided the lamb. And this is the imagery that John the Baptist is talking about. And when Abraham took Isaac up there, Mount Moriah is where Jerusalem is located. Mount Moriah, they believe the location that Abraham took Isaac to is where the Temple Mount 
was built, the first temple that was built, and then the second temple. And they still there today, you can go to what the Jews refer to as the Wailing Wall, which is the foundation of the old temple that no longer stands there. Mount Moriah, and, and so he took him up there. And in Exodus chapter 12, you find the Passover lamb where uh, when they were in Egypt and God was going to bring that final plague upon the Egyptians where the firstborn of every man, of, uh, you know, uh, every, uh, every, the firstborn, man and animal, were going to die. But the death angel was going to pass through the land and the children of Israel were to take a lamb without blemish, without spot, without flaw. And they were to take it and pin it up for four days. Take it on the 10th day at twilight, pin it up. And on the 14th day at twilight, they were to kill that lamb, take its blood, and put that blood over the doorpost of the doors of their house. So that when the death angel passed through and he saw the blood, that he would do what? He would pass over that house where the blood was applied. And so when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when he says takes away, they don't remain. He takes them. The lambs that they offered in the Old Testament sacrifices could not remove sin. But Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God can remove our sin and does remove our sin. As a matter of fact, in Psalm chapter 103, I like how the psalmist says it here in Psalm 103, verse, beginning verse 9, he will, says, He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as, the, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. So as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. For He knows our frame, He remembers that we are dust. Jesus came in order to redeem us, to rescue us. And those who reject Jesus in this life, there is a day of judgment that they are, they, it's like facing a, a train coming down the track. And every moment you stand there, that train is drawing closer. That train is it's gaining speed towards you and it's called the judgment of God. And all those who reject this Lamb of God will stand before this Lamb of God. We find in Revelation, the Lion of the tribe of Judah uh, when John saw him, he said, a lamb, uh, in John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 5, a lamb as though it had been slain, but it's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. You reject Jesus Christ, you face a day of judgment where God will tell you, because you have rejected my son, I reject you, and you will spend eternity in torment in hell. And John the Baptist tells his disciples, this is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's, he just goes on and says in verse 30, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. John, John the Baptist knows. He said, I, I'm six months older than Jesus, but he knew that he was before him. He was preexistent. He is the eternal God who took on human flesh, who came to this earth. He left the splendor of heaven and came to this earth. And John testifies that, he, that Jesus is before him. He says, I did not know him. That doesn't mean that he didn't know him personally, but he did not know that Jesus, growing up, I'm sure they had some interaction because they were cousins. That, that, but he did not know that Jesus was the Messiah. I wonder in their interactions, and we don't know, the Bible does not tell us, we would assume they had some interactions. Perhaps John the Baptist was with Jesus' family when they went to the temple when Jesus was 12 years old. They went up to Jerusalem. And you remember when Jesus was left behind and Mary and Joseph went back looking for him. Perhaps John the Baptist was there then. I, I don't know. But you have to wonder, did he see something as Jesus was growing up? Maybe Warned you, but he said, I did not know. And he said, I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. He said, I came preparing the way for the Messiah. And how did he know this was him? Verse 32, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. Now see, in the Old Testament economy, and John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets, in the Old Testament economy, you see the Spirit coming and leaving upon an individual. The Spirit would empower an individual for service, the Spirit would leave. The Spirit would then come back upon that individual, and then the Spirit would leave. But Jesus 
The Holy Spirit descended, it says, in the form like, like a dove, and he remained upon him. And John says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we know that the baptism, baptism of Jesus that in the other gospel accounts that they heard uh, God the Father speak from, he from heaven, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit descending like a dove. It's a picture of the Trinity. We don't find the word Trinity in Scripture, but we find it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all three present here. And John says, this is how I know that he is the Messiah. The one who sent me told me that whom I see the Spirit descending upon and remaining upon him, it is he. And he said, this is who I bear witness of. And he says here in verse 34, and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now, John, in his gospel, makes an explanation, and we'll see this in this next passage that we're going to look at, but John the Baptist here is bearing witness that Jesus is the Son of God. When people say that Jesus is not the Son of God, that Jesus was just a good moral example, he was just a rabbi that uh, was well known as they, he didn't attend any of the rabbinical schools. Uh, but yet, he, he knew the Scriptures. How did he know the Scriptures? Because Jesus gave the Scriptures. He is the Word of God. You go back to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, Jesus is the Word of God. He was very familiar with it. And when he went to a synagogue in his hometown, and they handed him the scroll of Isaiah, and he opened it up and read from the scroll, they were amazed at his teaching they were amazed even when he was 12 when he got left behind there in Jerusalem and they found him there in the temple talking with the leading rabbis and so John the Baptist says this is the son of God what he's saying is pay attention this is he of whom I've been testifying is coming the one I've been saying to, to get ready for he's now here verse 35 again the next day John stood with two of his disciples it would be Andrew, John, we believe. And he tells me, he said, looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Again, he points to Jesus. So this is three days in a row that John is bearing witness, first to those sent by the religious leaders, then among his own disciples, and now again the next day to, to Andrew and John, the apostle, who would become the apostle John. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples who heard him speak uh, uh, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Now, what's interesting is that they followed after him. Normally, disciples would select the rabbi that they chose, that they would choose to follow. They would, they would look at the different rabbis, and, and they would say, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll line more with what this rabbi is teaching, because the rabbis, some of them, their teaching varied. Some of them had uh, a, a stellar reputation, Gam Gamaliel, whom Paul learned under was one that we know of and normally they would choose the rabbi that they would then follow and learn from they would be that's what a disciple is is a learner but Jesus chose them he called his disciples to follow him how do we know that well just over in the book of John chapter 15 and uh, verse 16 Jesus said you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. He said at the end of verse 19, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Jesus chose his disciples. Jesus chose his apostles. In Luke chapter 6, it says in uh, verse 12 that it came to pass in those days that he, Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 men whom he also named apostles. Now, disciples are learners, followers. Apostles are ones who have been commissioned, ones who have been sent. And he says he chose them, and, they, and here they are. He says, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew. Bartholomew would be the Nathaniel we see here in John chapter 1. 
Matthew, who's also called Levi, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Now, Judas, the, same, the son of James, is referred to in some other texts as Thaddeus. But Jesus called and chose these 12 disciples to then be his apostles. And one of them was the one who would betray him. And so he chose him. And so as these two came out to follow him, Jesus turned and, and seeing them followed and said to them, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, teacher, where are you staying? See, John the apostle is writing this gospel to prove that Jesus is the son of God. He's writing to Jew and Gentile. And how do we know that he's writing to Gentiles? Because he explains things that Jews would have understood. A Jew wouldn't have needed for the word rabbi to be translated, but a Gentile would. And that's why he does it. We'll see he does this again in a few moments. But he says, they said, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. There's an invitation. There is still an invitation from Jesus today to come and see, to, to, to learn from him. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for it is light. He says, cast your burdens upon me. We are to come to Jesus. The invitation is still there. The problem is not that we cannot come to Jesus. The problem is that we do not respond to Jesus. Jesus said that these two disciples come and see, and they came and saw where he was staying. Jesus extends an invitation. The problem is we do not respond to the invitation that Jesus extends to us. We have the opportunity to come to his word. We have the completed word of God. We've got... As I mentioned earlier, more Bibles in our home. We got Bibles on our phones, Bibles on our iPads, Bibles on our Kindles, Bibles on our Nooks. We got Bibles everywhere. We've got it on audio tape. We've got it on CDs. We can stream it. And the invitation is to learn, to come and to learn. And so they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. And that was about the 10th hour. Now, that could have meant it was either 10 a.m., or it would have been about four in the afternoon. Depend upon how they, they, the reason I say that, because in some of the gospel accounts in the crucifixion, in Matthew, it says about the sixth hour, that, that's noon, because their day started, what they consider the day started at six. So the third hour would be 9 a.m. The sixth hour would be noon. The, tenth, uh, the, the ninth hour of the day would be three o'clock. Depend upon how, but regardless, they came and they spent that rest of the day with Jesus. He doesn't tell us what Jesus taught them, but he just says that they spent the rest of the day there. Verse 40 tells us who one of the two were, the other one we believe to be the Apostle John because he never names himself. It says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And what did Andrew do? It says he first found his own brother. There was a priority there. He went and got Peter, his brother, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. See, there again, John has given an explanation here for his Gentile audience. He said, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, the anointed one. He said, we found him, and he brought Peter to Jesus. See, it's not enough just to tell somebody to Jesus. We need to help bring people to Jesus. We need to Show them Jesus from the scriptures. We need to let them see Jesus in our lives, the way we live and our testimony and the way we speak and the way we act. And yes, we all fail in that regard. But we are to bring people to Jesus. And he just says here, we have found the Messiah. Uh, in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, in John 4 verse, verses 28 through 30, this woman that Jesus had the encounter with at the, at the well in Samaria this woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. You, you find Andrew going to get his brother Peter. Uh, and in a moment, we're going to see Philip going to get Nathaniel. We see the Samaritan woman going into her village and telling the people there who would have been people that would have looked down upon her because of her lifestyle and some of the decisions that she had made. But yet they responded. You say, well, people are not going to listen to me because of, of how I've lived my life. I just point to the Samaritan woman. She, had, she didn't have a stellar reputation. But yet it was evident that something 
And not only just something, but someone had touched her life. And that someone was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the people responded. So Andrew goes and gets Peter. And now when he, uh, and he brought him to Jesus, verse 42 says, And now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. And again, John translates that, he says, which is translated a stone. Now we find this in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus uh, asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? And some say Elijah, and some say uh, the, pro- the prophet, uh, John the Baptist, or Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Peter, when Jesus says here, you shall be called Cephas, it's the word Petros, in the Greek, and it means a stone or a pebble. And, the, but, and it's very closely related to the word Petra, which is a rock, which is like a, a large boulder. So in Matthew 16, when he says, you, and you are Peter, Petros, you are a, a pebble, and upon this rock, what rock? Not upon Peter, of the rock of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Catholics have taken this to believe that, that Peter is the foundation of the church. No, Jesus is the foundation of the church. It was Peter's confession that Jesus was the Son of God. And it's a, it's a play on the Greek words, but Petros and Petra, while they are related entomologically, and the way words are related, they're not the same. And Jesus says, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone, Petros, Peter. That's where we get the name Peter from. The following day, now it's the next day. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip. Jesus found Philip. Philip didn't find Jesus. Jesus found Philip and said to him, follow me. There is, there is the invitation. At least six of the apostles received a specific command from Jesus to follow me. They were Peter, Andrew, James, and John, uh, Matthew, and Philip. Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, was sitting at his booth collecting taxes when Jesus came by and said, follow me. His disciples, he, he said to Peter, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. They received a personal invitation. And then Philip says he was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. We know Peter more related to Capernaum. He moved there later, Capernaum, just east of Bethsaida on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Philip was from the same area, and Philip found Nathaniel. There's this, you know, Andrew went and got his brother Peter. Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. I want to ask you something. Are you looking for anybody to bring to Jesus? You say, I've not found anybody. Have you gone looking? There there are people all around us. People say, I I don't know anybody. All all the people I know are are saved. Really? The stores where you shop? The businesses, the people that work? They're all Christians? We just need to be looking and do what they did. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. When he says that Moses in the law, Deuteronomy 18, we looked at last week about the prophet. Moses said, God's going to send a prophet like me. Him you shall hear. Philip goes to Nathaniel and said, we found him. The Old Testament scriptures speak about it. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? See, There was the story that the religious leaders taught. When they said to Jesus, we were not born of fornication. They were talking about that Jesus, that Mary. See, there was a major highway that the Roman soldiers would travel upon just on the outskirts of Nazareth. And it was considered, Nazareth was considered to have prostitutes. And so they had heard the story of the virgin birth. And so Nazareth did not have, as a city, did not have a a great reputation, if you will, among some of the Israelites. And so when Nathaniel asked us, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Cana was west of Nazareth. Uh, 
And Canaan was not that big a town. Nazareth just had about 2,000 people. And so he just asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. You remember Jacob, the son of Isaac, Jacob and Esau? Jacob, his name means supplanter, deceiver. Jesus says here to Nathanael, an Israelite in whom, in, in whom is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I want to tell you something. There's never a moment in our life where God does not see us. Where God does not take note of us. We never get lost in the crowd. Have you ever been to a store? You remember taking your children, you go to the store and one of the children wandered off? Do you ever have that occur to you where your child just, you lost sight of for a minute and you began to panic because where are they at? God never loses sight of us. And he tells, Nathan Jesus told Nathaniel, when you were sitting under the fig tree, before Philip even called you, I saw you. His omniscience. And Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, because I answered and said to you, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? He said, you will see greater things than these. And, and he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You remember when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau and was going to his uncle Laban's house there in Genesis? That that night he had that vision of a ladder descending from heaven and angels going up and down? Jesus has brought heaven down to earth and Jesus is the only way to get back to heaven, or to get to heaven. Not get back, we ain't been there yet. But Jesus is the only way there, John 14, 6. And that's what Jesus is saying to him. He said, I'm the only way. I am representing God. I am the Son of God. I am God, my Father, has sent me. And the Holy Spirit, and when he says there, he says, greater things you'll see, not only greater things will you see. In John chapter 14, and this is something I was looking for uh, last week or maybe Wednesday night about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said here that when we have the Holy Spirit in John 14, 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. He says to Nathaniel, you will see greater things than these. Nathaniel's going to get to see Jesus cause the lame to walk the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the mute to speak, the lepers to be cleansed, the dead to be raised to life, the storm to be calm, the fish and the bread multiplied on two occasions and passed out to the multitudes. He's going to see demons being cast out, that Jesus cast out. He's going to see greater things than that. He says, why? Because I am the Son of God. As John testified, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus says, I am God, and you will see greater things. Jesus is worth our time. He is worth our attention. And I can just tell you this, that if you do not pay attention to Jesus, if you do not live your life and surrender to him, that one day you're going to stand before him as a judge. And you will not hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Instead, you will hear him say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. See, it's not about just going to church. It's about Jesus, because without Jesus, there is no church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It belongs to him. And you and I are to worship him and to live for him and to tell others about him. May we do that. Let's stand and pray. Father, we all have failed you at different times in different ways and or in multitudes of times and multitudes of ways. Lord, there are none of, none of us here who have made you known as we ought to do. There are none of us here that have gone out as much as we should 
and told others about you. Lord, it's easy to criticize the world and the culture in which we live today. But Lord, we see here, the world can be changed one person at a time. Lord, we live in a society where we want instant gratification. But Lord, if we would just begin to share, to see others come to faith in Christ and to be discipled and to learn and to grow, Lord, as that would be multiplied out, what could be done in the kingdom's work? Lord, help us to be found faithful. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, we're going, to, we're going to meet at Coastal Manor in Little Wissy. You can bring kids. It's not a problem. Blaine and them brought the kids last time. You got, ain't a lot of us got kids at home, but uh, you can bring the kids. Miss Linda Ann loved to see them. Uh, this is just, we're going to go just like we did about a month, a uh, month and a half ago, whenever it was we went last month, uh, and just be a blessing to her. We probably at some point will do this for Miss Lucille as well and some others. Uh, what I call taking the church outside the doors, going and ministering to some. I want to encourage you to come be a part of this tonight. Miss Linda Ann would love to see you. It's not going to be a long service. We're going to sing a couple of songs. I'm going to do a, a little devotion. We're just going to pray with them, and then you'll be free to go. So if you just give a little bit of time tonight, I know it's a little bit of a drive up there. Maybe some of you want to ride together. Some of you did that last time. I want to encourage you to be here tonight. Be there tonight. There will be nothing here at the church tonight. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night as well. All right. Anything else? All right. Jim Cornelius, will you dismiss us with prayer, please, sir?